good evening uh, so today we will be talking about uh, sprangle shoulder so so today we are going to talk about sprangle shoulder which is an important condition <laughs> from the exam point of view and uh, uh, it's a rare condition but if at all you see it it uh, it does pose a significant clinical problem uh, in the pediatric population so what is a sprangle shoulder it is basically a congenital elevation of the scapula it is a rare condition and it happens to be the most common congenital abnormality of the shoulder girdle. Now this disorder can vary in severity. So it could be a very mild problem which is only cosmetic and it could be a very severe problem which could be cosmetic and functional. So the shoulder range of motion will also be affected in the severe category. Now this severity is progressive. That means when the child grows or as the child grows, the mild variants can progress to a severe moderate or a severe variety. And that is why we need to identify the condition and follow these patients up even if they are having mild abnormalities. Sprengle deformity is a developmental condition. The associated pathophysiology is related to the embryology of the upper extremity. Okay, so it's not just the bone, but even the surrounding structure, which are structures which are required for the normal development of the scapula. Now, when we see a sprangle shoulder, the elevated scapula is the most obvious presenting sign. But it is not just the elevated scapula, but also a smaller or hypoplastic scapula and hypoplastic musculature around this hypoplastic scapula. <laughs> Apart from uh, this, we need to know that uh, this is a developmental condition starting all the way from the embryology. Okay, so uh, the process of scapula formation uh, occurs through a germ cell layer differentiation during the embryonic periods between the third and eighth weeks of pregnancy. And at this time, the scapula is at the level of the fourth or fifth cervical vertebra. Now, if this fails to descend, we get what we know as the sprangle shoulder. So in a normal individual or in a normal embryological development, the scapula migrates downwards during its development. And by six weeks, we see that the scapula has reached to its lower position, which is at the level of the seventh thoracic vertebra. So that's a tip of the, or the lower end of the scapula, which is at the seventh thoracic vertebra. So uh, that's from the embryological point of view, but as a child grows, the scapula ossifies and this ossification happens through intramembranous ossification. Okay. Now, when uh, we talked about the bone as such, but when we have a sprangle deformity, it's not just the hypoplastic and elevated bone, but also the musculature around that, around the scapula, which is hypoplastic. That is because uh, for the musculature to develop, we require a scaffolding. Uh, uh, it requires a framework on which the musculature can attach. Now, when the framework that is a scapula, it's, it itself is hypoplastic. Even the musculature around it will be hypoplastic. This is, uh, if we have to take another example from the pediatric ortho, it would be something like the development of the femoral head and the uh, acetabulum. Now, in a DDH, if the uh, femoral head is within the acetabulum, both of them grow because they correspond to each other. But if the, uh, the pediatric hip is dislocated, then neither the acetabular cup, neither the femoral head, both of them will not develop. Okay. Similarly here, it is not just the scapula, but also the surrounding musculature, which will not develop. Okay. Now the scapula fails to descend to its normal position in a sprangle shoulder, which leaves the hypoplastic scapula elevated and malrotated. So when we see uh, these conditions, they will often be uh, present along with other deformities such as clipple field deformities, uh, Poland anomaly, the Mobius syndrome. So these are all also seen together because these are all conditions which arise from embryonic developmental problems. Okay. Now, if we talk about the etiology, most of these cases are sporadic. The etiology remains unknown. But there are two theories 
the first one is a vascular theory where we talk about the sub uh, the subclavian vasculature being abnormal which uh, during the uh, embryonic development which leads to this problem and the second one would be a genetic condition where uh, it is postulated to be an autosomal dominant condition but again this is not yet proven beyond uh, contesting okay so as of now the case is sporadic and the etiology remains unknown but the two four running uh, theories are that of subclavian uh, vasculature problems and the second one is genetic now if we have a clinical evaluation of these children it has two problems the first one is cosmetic the second one is functional so the cosmetic problem is caused by the elevated and mal rotated scapula so what do we mean by elevated by elevated we mean that the inferior pole of the scapula is at a higher level and the inferior border is also rotated medially such that it is closer to the midline so <laughs> now if the inferior border of the scapula is towards the midline then the glenoid cavity is going to be facing downwards and if the glenoid cavity or the glenohumeral joint is facing downwards this leads to a problem with the abduction of the shoulder okay so this will lead to decreased range of motion of abduction of the shoulder so with the inferior border present medially the glenoid cavity present inferiorly the superior medial border of the scapula will be present high up in the neck and this will lead to a presence of fullness in the neck now if this fullness is above the uh, thoracic vertebrae it will lead to a visible deformity okay so anywhere along the cervical vertebrae this will lead to a visible deformity okay and this superior medial fullness depends on where the superior medial border of the scapula lies so that is a cosmetic abnormality now if we talk about the functional limitation it results from the decreased range of motion of the shoulder joint and the typical range of motion which is uh, decreased is that of shoulder abduction okay it has two reasons the first one is the scapula is at a higher level and it's mal rotated so scapulothoracic motion is lacking in these individuals and the second one is that the glenohumeral cavity or the glenohumeral joint is facing downwards or inferiorly so in these children the range of motion of abduction is usually less than 90 degrees and they can affect activities of daily life now apart from the problem of the scapula itself we also need to know that these children present with one or more associated abnormalities out of which scoliosis klippelfeld syndrome rib anomalies and omo vertebral bone are present in about half of these children so these are the things you need to look for in almost all children with a sprengel shoulder scoliosis klippel field syndrome rib anomalies and omo vertebral bone or omo vertebral junctional abnormalities apart from this we have spina bifida torticollis clavicular problems humeral shortening femoral shortening ctev ddh pes planus and others which are seen in a minority of cases now what is this omo vertebral bone that we talk about this bone is a connection between the scapula and the vertebrae typically at the level of c4 to c7 now this connection can either be fibrous cartilaginous or it could also be well formed bone okay so it extends from the superior medial border of the scapula till the cervical spine c4 to c7 now recognition of this problem or this bone is essential because it interferes with the shoulder motion and may interfere also with scapular descent okay so this is a resected omo vertebral bone which is seen here now when we come to uh, after the clinical evaluation we need to do imaging in these children 